Hey everyone, this is Know Your Potential, NYP episode eight, and we'll be celebrating Bitcoin's new milestone alongside answering your questions about the economy and blockchain. Welcome to the show. You're listening to Know Your Potential with David and Phil Nyo, your source for motivational insight and discussion of all things relating to business, technology, and life. We banter and interview like-minded individuals striving to be the best version of themselves, generate value for society, and achieve the life they want to live. Hey everyone, it's Phil Go here. Hey everyone, this is David Ngo. Welcome to our show, Know Your Potential. Hope everyone's doing well. Yeah, welcome back. And uh, David, we should uh, bring out the confetti. Bitcoin surpassed 50K. Huge milestone. Um, honestly, I think at the beginning of the year, no one really ever thought it would happen this quickly, at least. We were all hoping it would hit 50,000 by the end of the year. And right now we're the end of February. So less than two months in, we went from 20, some odd 30,000, I think it was, to 50,000. So pretty insane. That's It's pretty nuts because when you think about it, like what goes up must come down as well. Like we, we hit 50K pretty quickly. And, um, and that's usually one of the things that happens, right? When things go up way too quick, it does correct. Well, that's what it is. I mean, since the beginning of our show, we've always said uh, crypto, Bitcoin is super, super volatile to always be super cautious about it and not to overinvest, uh, not to over leverage, super important. And as we saw with Bitcoin, it went uh, all the way up to like 58,400 uh, over the weekend. And then right now it tanked the past two days to about 46,000 is where it's at right now. So again, Am I nervous about it? To be honest, it sucks going down from, from 58 to 46. But at the same time, it's one of those, it had to get corrected. It's going to take time. And uh, like, like you know, again, it's one of those things where Bitcoin just has to find its place against pricing right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, like, I don't know about you, but I'm not really a day trader. I tend to, wh- whenever I sell, the price goes back up. So, <laughs> you know, like at, at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I'm not a fortune teller, neither are you. And, um, you know, these things happen. It's just market dynamics. Yeah, that's what it is. So, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot less concerned or less worried about it because like you said, I'm not a day trader. Um, I'm not afraid of my coins getting liquidated. I'm pretty much just have my money in, uh, in crypto, uh, crypto right now, just sitting there. And uh, I'm just going to wait for a few years to see where it is then. Uh, not so worried about what happens today or tomorrow and next month. It's one of those, it's a long-term investment for me. Yeah. And speaking of investments, I mean, we got a bunch of questions that came in to the podcast and we're going to take the opportunity to really um, use this episode to answer as many of them as we can. And uh, just going right into it, David, I mean, one of the big questions that people always ask us is about investing. Yeah. And uh, Vinny has questioned here about how you would invest $100, $500, $1,000 today. Um, I don't know, Phil, how would you invest it first? How would you, how would you put it in? So the way that I approach investing is I look at it from a macro perspective. So I'm really looking at more so um, how the economy is doing, where we're kind of trending, not necessarily focus um, on just the crypto space. Like I look at all different kinds of markets. Um, and I mean, one of the big concerns that I have is with all this new stimulus money that's going into the US, I think it's like 1.9 trillion. And a bunch of that is going to be uh, $1,400 checks that go directly to people. So when I think about something like that, that means, okay, there's a huge difference between money that gets, um, that gets created into the system by, you know, uh, lending like mortgages and stuff like that. But then there's also money being created when it just becomes a check that gets sent to people and they can spend it right away. That's usually what's called broad money supply. And usually when that inflates, um, there is a potential for inflation at that point, because now you've got money going into people's hands directly. And what that means is people are going to go out and spend it, especially when things start reopening again. And then you're going to get more money in the system, not enough goods. And that is the cause for inflation. And that's my biggest worry right now. So in terms of investing, um, it might be good to take a little bit more of a risk adverse approach. Um, so you, if you're watching today on, uh, was it Tuesday, the 23rd. February 23rd, you'll, yeah. you'll notice a lot of tech stocks have been selling off in the, in the stock market because a lot of the times tech stock is, um, in terms of their price to earnings ratio is a lot higher. So they, the stock price is trading higher than what the company is worth based on like things like revenue, for example. So you see all these tech companies selling off, all this risk coming out of the system. 
So if you're looking for a safe place to put it, I mean, I usually look at value stocks. So like the companies that have been around for years and years have a very steady, constant flow of revenue. You're looking at like, you know, the Walmarts and the Johnson Johnsons and those kind of companies where it would be a lot more safer for you to put money into, you know, your blue chip stocks. That's kind of where I like to take my risk off and, and put it into something a little bit more safe like that. That's pretty interesting because I might be a little bit different. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more of a gambler, a bit more of a riskier investor, I guess you could say. Uh, for me right now, I think some of the interesting things to be looking at, again, like you mentioned, is kind of to look forward, right? So I would say um, anything in uh, travel, entertainment, um, again, these have taken a huge beating in the past uh, six to 18 months or so. And though there is still coronavirus, though it's not uh, completely eradicated, I mean, we have a vaccine and all of that stuff, people are still looking forward to going out, looking forward to traveling. So right now, I think a lot of these stocks have taken a huge beating, have taken um, quite a haircut. Uh, so again, it might be worth looking into it, but just because it's dropped so much, it might have some traction to regain back. As for in terms of value wise, no, you can't really say these stocks are good value investments because the reality is um, flight and travel and everything is still down drastically compared to last year. So by no means are these value stocks. It's, I would say it's more along the lines of it's dropped so much that I would hope that it's going to re be recovering in the next uh, year, two years, three years. So again, for me, I think in investing into travel stocks, entertainment stocks uh, would work well. Um, even tech stocks, to be honest, it's just one of those things where um, so far you can't go wrong with tech. And by tech, I mean, going with, uh, you know, with the big names, I would go with uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft, a few of those guys where, again, it's just, they're here to stay. They're not going to be gone by tomorrow. It's one of those companies uh, mm -hmm. I would be looking into investing more. Yeah. Well, I've noticed a, a huge trend of people actually putting money into those stocks, of course, because by holding on to cash right now, you're actually losing value, right? So... Uh, based on that, people are investing into the future. So even though yeah. a company like Tesla doesn't make more than like a billion in profit each year, people are investing in things like Tesla because they believe in the future value of something like Tesla and they think it's going to be worth more than what it's, what it's making right now. Like uh, there's even an argument to be made that, uh, bit, uh, that uh, when Tesla invests in Bitcoin, they made more money that year on Bitcoin <laughs> than they did uh, by selling cars, which is hilarious. <laughs> Uh, and, and you know what? Talking about Bitcoin investing, uh, some of the other the other stocks I would maybe mention investing into are miners or any companies that are holding Bitcoin. Again, though it's gone from fifty eight thousand to forty six thousand, and that sounds like a terrible time to be telling people to invest into it. Again, if you're looking at it on a longer timeline of you know again one year, three year, five years, ten years, uh, again I think there's a good potential there that you mm -hmm. can get a lot more returns on in the next uh, you know five ten years as hopefully Bitcoin eventually. You know, Gets back to 50,000, 75,000, 100,000 dollars a coin. Um, that's really going to, again, increase the value of those companies. Yeah. You, you know what's funny? Very quickly, um, we were talking about penny stocks earlier uh, before we recorded the podcast. And I mean, when you look at something like, um, like these blockchain miners, um, like HUD8 and, uh, and Riot and, and um, Hive blockchain in Canada, I mean, these were going for less than a dollar. Um, at the beginning of uh, March 2020, when everything was crashing. And I mean, you know, technically they were considered penny stocks, but we, I obviously knew, for example, like what these companies did as, as their business. And uh, these companies are now worth like, you know, $10, $15. Yeah, it's, now. it's got up like 10, 15, 20, 30 X, some yeah. of these, these ones. So, I mean, uh, those ones, again, these are unicorn ones, I would think, right? But again, yeah. if, if you knew what it was going to be or where the future was with crypto, if we all knew it was going to get to 50,000, um, that, that would have been a fantastic investment. Yeah, for sure. See, speaking of that, um, Vincent also has a question about um, getting into Bitcoin. So he asks, is there a point of even getting into Bitcoin right now when it's this expensive? And Phil, how do you feel about that? I mean, like expensive is a perception, I think. Um, depends what you see as like expensive long-term. I usually like to look at something like Bitcoin, a more long-term perspective, because obviously it has its up and up and downs. It can go up 20% one day. It can also go down 20% one day. But if you're looking at Bitcoin at like a five-year horizon, I mean, even people, anybody that invests in 2017 is now, you know, above their break-even point, 
right? So when you look at it from a longer perspective, you kind of think about, okay, well, the central bank is continuing to print and print and print. So money devaluation is expensive. You know, you can look at your savings account, which is returning you what, 1% if you're lucky. Um, you can look at that as being expensive when savings accounts used to be like six, 7%. So it really depends on, on your perception of it because as long as they keep printing money, Bitcoin really has no, no roof. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the difference about uh, Bitcoin and any other companies or any regular investments, if you want to call it that, right? With a regular investment, um, you look at their total sales, their total uh, minus their costs and expenses, what is their leftover profit? And that's, you know, you, you multiply by X amount. That's how you have the valuation of that company. But with Bitcoin, again, there is no roof to that. There is no um, valuation of any way anyone can calculate it. It's really how I see it. it's one of those, a belief as to what it's worth and a matter of supply and demand, as we've mentioned before in previous episodes. And right now, again, I still feel, though the price is very you know, expensive, if you want to call it that, at $50,000 a coin, um, at the same time, when it went to, you know, from zero to a hundred, was that expensive? And then when it got to a thousand dollars, was that too expensive or 10,000? Was that too, too expensive? And literally when it hit 20,000, uh, recently, and that kind of passed the all time high of, uh, you know, since it passed X since prior to all this crazy, you know, 50,000 here, it really stayed at 20,000 for, I think a few days. And then it went all the way up to where we are today and it's never seen 20,000 again. So at what point do you say it's too expensive? So that's really Difficult to say. And again, if you're asking me, is it too expensive at 50,000? When hopefully by next year, if it's 100,000, I'm going to obviously say, no, 50,000 was damn cheap. It was a 50% discount from where it is today. So all of that is perspective. Um, when you're buying in, uh, how the value of the coin itself. So uh, again, it's a matter of, is there enough people who are adopting this? And again, I do believe that there are many, many, many more people trying to buy Bitcoin, Bitcoin than sell Bitcoin right now and in the next five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And and this is also with the institutions and stuff that are also getting involved now. So there's a lot more deep pockets that are getting into it now. But if you even take like, because I like to look at Bitcoin from like at least a four or five year timeline. And uh, even just taking that into account, if you look at the Bitcoin price in 2015 or 2016, I mean, what, it was like a thousand, a few thousand dollars at most uh, during those times. And I mean, when you look back at it, you think, oh, you know, Bitcoin was damn cheap when it was at like $2,000, stuff like that. But people back in those days were like, oh, Bitcoin sounds too expensive. Is that $2,000 right now? You know, like it really, if you look at it, if you zoom out a little bit and you look at the longer timeline, that's, you know, the general trend is up and it yeah. only makes sense by being a deflationary asset. So I mean, that's, that's really how yeah, I see and, it. And again, the, the main thing is, you know, back to supply and demand. As I mentioned in one of the previous episodes, we, they, there are roughly 100 million Bitcoin wallets out there right now, again, which aren't all unique. So the question again is what happens when there are 200 million, 500 million, 1 billion wallets? So when you kind of, again, do the numbers, to me, it's very obvious. Maybe it's not, but we'll see what happens in five years, 10 years. Hopefully, uh, you know, it is where we're, we're hoping it to be in five, 10 years, right? So. Until then, we'll find out. We'll see what happens. Right. And I, I mean, like, if you look at one of the biggest advocates right now um, in the space is Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy. And he's the one that's starting to bring all the corporates on board and, um, and trying to convince them as to, like, why you would want to have some Bitcoin on your balance sheet. Because at the end of the day, he looks at cash as a liability. But if you ever take an accounting course 101, cash is supposed to be an asset because you can use it to, you know, like buy things, pay people, et cetera. But now because of all the printing that's happening, there's this new viewpoint that cash is actually a liability on your balance, your balance sheet. So very interesting. Like um, Nat actually asked a question about like, why did Tesla buy Bitcoins and why should corporate treasuries buy Bitcoin? And this is exactly the reason here. And uh, Michael Saylor likes to use Argentina as a example. You know, if you were an Argentinian company and you were making Argentina, uh, was it pesos or boulevards yeah, pesos. or something? Like, pesos. I believe it's pesos. Why, exactly. Why would you want to keep your profits in that currency when you know it's going to crash against something like US dollars, for example? 
and, and that's what it is, right? There's been a lot of um, currencies around the world that have been depreciating so much in the past, you know, one year, two years, uh, many more years than that even. And for all these guys, like you mentioned, even the people, you know, the corporate people or even the, you know, the, the regular folks like you and I who are there, for no reason at all, no fault of theirs, with their country printing more money, their their buying power keeps getting, keeps decreasing. So that's why this definitely helps a lot of the people who want to invest into Bitcoin, which again, as we mentioned before, is a depreciating um, asset compared to cash, which is c- continually increasing De- the amount. Deflating, you Deflating, mean. sorry, yes, yeah. yes, deflating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so it's very interesting because like um, Michael Saylor actually had his um, Bitcoin for corporations um, his conference recently. And, um, it was basically to try to get all these C-level executives, um, and trying to pitch to them why they should have some Bitcoin, in their balance sheet as part of their corporate treasuries. And, um, really when you think about it, the job of a C-level executive of a company is to preserve and increase shareholder value. So when you look at it in that sense, like why would you ever be holding something like cash, which is actually depreciating over time, especially as they continue to print, why would holding on to that be good for your shareholders? And, and that's the thing, right? So I guess a lot of these guys, they kind of understand that now or understand it better when they really look deeper into it. Because we've always just been taught cash is king. I've, I have remember that saying since the longest time ever. And that's, again, it depends on when the time for cash is king, right? When, when all the stock prices drop and you have all the cash to buy, it, yes, it's king. But again, other than that, most people who do have cash or a lot of rich people don't have just don't just have cash sitting in their bank account at all. A lot of this money is invested into real estate, invested into stocks, uh, invested into companies. A lot of rich people um, are kind of living off of, uh, you know, kind of, I don't want to say like uh, negative money, kind of like how uh, Elon Musk also, right? After he sold PayPal, he pretty much took all of that money, invested it into uh, Tesla, SpaceX, and then he had no money on, he was living off of some on someone else's couch. So it's mm-hmm. one of those things where people just say, I'm not going to keep money or cash in my bank account because it does nothing for me. I'd rather take it, use it and produce something or create something with it that will give me a bigger return on it than just having cash sitting in there, which gives me, which allows me to buy less every single year. Exactly. Like that's the whole point of, uh, of, of when they say like beating the, uh, the rate of inflation, right? Because when you think about it, if you can make the 2%, let's just say that inflation is uh, in, in one year, you've pretty much kept the value of it at that point. But what you need to do is you need to exceed that. So if you're not doing anything with your money and inflation is up two, 3%, you've lost two or 3% of your value already just from it sitting there. And I think one of the biggest things that a lot of people do not realize is with all this money printing that's happening and all this manipulation and devaluation of the dollar, it also affects how we measure value in other things. Because if you're using something like USD, as like your measuring stick. If that measuring stick is growing or shrinking alongside you trying to measure it, you're going to have a very hard time trying to come up with a very legitimate valuation of something. And that's where you get all these distortions in things like Tesla's stock price, for example. It's like, what is it? 70 to a hundred times their, um, their price to earnings ratio. Like it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're one of the highest, uh, most expensive, stocks, if you want to call it that, right? Yeah. So uh, I really don't know if Warren Buffett invests invest into Tesla, actually. Do you know that? If, if he does, it, does I, it, it would I go against know. everything that he believes in terms of what to invest into in, in the type of companies, right? So exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so Veronica had another yeah. question, uh, a little bit similar to the one that we had before, pretty much saying, where do you see Bitcoin going? Phil? Um, short term? So short, short-term wise, you know, like, we know about this halving cycle pattern. So if you look at the charts for Bitcoin against a fiat like USD, which is like the standard um, standard trade that you would look at, every four years, there's a halving cycle. And usually it's the first two years where Bitcoin makes its significant gains before it starts to recorrect before the next halving cycle. So the one that happened recently would have been May, 2020. So using that as a measure Uh, theoretically, we should be seeing Bitcoin's um, new all-time high sometime around, you know, the Q2, Q3 of 2021. Um, And then based on those models, it'll start to correct again. Um, 
I do know like these these are just based on like historical models. Obviously, like the game is different now, you know, when you have all these deep pockets and and corporates and hedge funds starting to get into it. There's an argument to be made that these models are old. There's also an argument to be made that history repeats itself and that uh, we'll see Bitcoin, I don't know, close to 100K, maybe more in, in and, uh, probably the next few months. And that's the thing with, with Bitcoin, right? You can't, though you can look at the, you know, the historical charts of it, though you can look at um, the historical charts of all other stocks, Bitcoin is not the same as anything we've ever seen before. Uh, again, just the fact that to, to a lot of people, this is imaginary digital coin that went from literally zero dollars to you know almost fifty thousand dollars again right now. So again, you cannot compare this to anything else in that sense. Uh, but also in terms of short term, as we mentioned, there's a lot more deeper pockets, right? So Micro Strategy just recently purchased an additional one billion dollars more of Bitcoin. I think it was this week, was it? This week, last week, Phil? Yeah, I think they issued some more. Um debts securities or debts notes um, yeah. to purchase, like, I think it was a billion dollars more of Bitcoin. And they should be announcing that very shortly as to how much they got and what, at what price point, because I believe the purchase happened within the last few days. Yeah. So, yeah. so and, and in terms of Bitcoin long-term, what do you think? What do you see, Phil? Well, I, I think, like I said, you know, if you're looking at Bitcoin from a long-term perspective, you know, even if you look at four or five years ago, it, every time you go to a Bitcoin and then you say, what happened to you four to five years ago? Um, it just looks astronomical. So uh, looking at it from that time frame, who knows, maybe in 2026, we might be looking back and saying, hey, man, like 46K Bitcoin, lucky you. It was so cheap, <laughs> 46,000 a coin. <laughs> Right. I think at the end of the day, like, you know, as long as they keep printing money, there is theoretically no ceiling to Bitcoin's value when you compare it to US dollars. Which yeah. Just keeps yeah. Because also, I mean, the, th the thing with, with Bitcoin is that, again, uh, because it's not like any one company or anything, the customers of Bitcoin are pretty much every single person on the planet. Right. Every single person that that can have a, a wallet to hold Bitcoin is a potential customer of theirs. And again, it's a matter of supply and demand. As I keep saying, it's just a matter of eventually going forward. My kids are going to want Bitcoin. Even right now, I talk to them about, about Bitcoin. So they understand that. And to them, that has a value to it. And just like I'm sure a lot of other Bitcoin holders talk to their kids about you know, crypto or Bitcoin, they understand there's a value to it. So again, the next generation will see why Bitcoin is good or why crypto is good. And that's why I just see that there is more, there's only going to be more and more people who want it than there are more people who want to sell it. Well, when you think about it, anybody that's starting to come into the space will always know about Bitcoin first. Bitcoin is sort of what laid the foundation for all of this because it was able to create a, a digital money that was, um, you know, incensorable, it is um, not inflatable. Um, and, it, and at the end of the day, like a lot of the people who are very prominent in this industry now all started off with just a simple father or a simple figure to just introduce them to Bitcoin and be like, this is what it is. Like you can say the same for Vitalik, Vitalik Buterin, who is the founder of Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like he, he was taught about Bitcoin by his dad um, before he started um, Bitcoin magazine back in the day. So. So again, it's, it's passed on from generation to generation, right? So pretty much yes. what our parents taught us about finances, we learn and now whatever we're learning, we're teaching it, passing it on to our kids. So uh, we do see there being a more of a, de a demand for, for Bitcoin than there is going to be supply for it eventually. So sure. this is a next question from Mike. This is going to be right up your alley, Phil. You love this. Uh, thoughts on Ethereum. And for anyone who doesn't know, Phil is probably a Ethereum fanboy first and then Bitcoin, I feel. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, like people make these comparisons about Bitcoin or Ethereum. And I don't yeah. think it's like a either or. I think they both have their place in the, the blockchain world and they both do completely different things. But um, back in the day, uh, I was actually, when I was reading the, the Ethereum white paper, it, it felt like it was a natural progression from something like Coin, because how Ethereum actually started was due to the fact that Vitalik Buterin, who is the creator of Ethereum, uh, was not able to do what he needed to on the Bitcoin blockchain because Bitcoin itself is limited in, um, 
in its ability to actually be programmable. So what that means is that um, there's not a lot of things that you can do with Bitcoin other than using it as like a form of money or for settlement. And um, because of this, it's actually a good thing for Bitcoin because it, it makes it less vulnerable to hacking and attacks and stuff like that. And that's why it's so resilient. But when you look at, okay, what else can I do with digital currencies? Um, and you start to think about, okay, well, what is the value of something like blockchain and the technology? You know, you can start doing a lot more things if you just had the ability to do it. So what Ethereum tries to solve here is that it's what's called the first Turing complete programmable blockchain. So back in the day, they used to sell it as like the world computer. Um, and basically what that meant is it's a computer that is able to, you know, recognize and decide uh, other data manipulation rule sets. So basically like a computer, that's what's considered Turing complete. It's basically smart enough to make decisions, <laughs> right? So when you have a blockchain that is able to compute, that is able to store data, um, you're able to do quite a few things with it actually. And this is where like a lot of the other use cases for blockchain start to come about because of a platform like Ethereum. So you can do things like smart contracts, which is kind of like programmable money. So for example, I can create a smart contract that says, um, I'm going to put you know one ether, which is the unit of account for Ethereum into this contract. And David will also put one Ethereum to this contract. And once David sells me something, um, you know, like a cup, for example, we can both sign and saying the transaction happened, we agree to it, and then the smart contract will be able to transfer that money you know, to the proper person. So you can have these smart contracts do many, many different things. And it's pretty much like with the creativity of developers and, and, and all these amazing uh, talented people out there, you can pretty much create almost anything and utilize the security and the transparency of a blockchain like Ethereum to be able to do it. So I'll give you an example, David, with, um, with some of these like cool things that people are developing. So there's a big, there's a big uh, industry called DeFi, which is, stands for decentralized finance. So when you look at stuff like, um, like the GameStop issue that we were talking about, how you were able to short more shares than actually existed, you wouldn't be able to do something like that if it was like, say, a token on Ethereum, because the blockchain will always know how many tokens exist and you can never exceed that, right? So you can do things like, like um, creating what are called stable coins on there, for example, which is like a one-to-one -one peg of like a US dollar to like a digital US dollar. So there's like a use case for that there's like exchanges. So like imagine a stock exchange that's not even, um, that's not controlled by anybody and you're able to make um, pretty much exchange, like being able to trade tokens without the need of a third party to do it. So it's just really, really cool. Like so, all the crazy so, things you can do. So pretty much a lot of the middlemen to all of these things, they're not happy with what Ethereum offers. Yeah, I mean, like, look, if if um, if Robinhood was able to, you know, stop trading because of X Y Z on on shares like GameStop, you can't actually do something like that on Ethereum. Like, you can't actually just shut down Ethereum and stop trade like trading these tokens. So, like, decentral decentralized finance has actually been like a big thing. I think the GameStop use case has actually made it. Um, made it more convincing that we need something like this. If that makes any sense at all. <laughs> um, there's, there's a bunch of like other things. You know what it is for some people, I'm sure it's going to make a lot of sense. Yeah. To some people it's not going to make any sense, but listen, yeah. you, you, you're passionate about, about crypto. You're passionate about Ethereum. So it's you're, it, you're, you're the right person to be asking these questions for sure. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if, if my last like five minutes of blabbering actually meant anything to anybody, but let's just let's just say this: like, a natural sort of progression of blockchain is going into um, these sort of new use cases, and there's like a whole economy being developed on 
on platforms like Ethereum? Yeah, so look, some of them are like what uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Yeah, so with uh, Ethereum, um, they actually created a standard that's called NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So what that means is that, um, you know, for example, like one US dollar equals one US dollar. It doesn't matter which bill you used as long as it says one dollar, it's all the same. The thing with like non-fungible tokens is that it's actually like a, a unique token now. So it's like a serialized sort of um, dollar bill in that sense. So like no one David coin, for example, has the same serial number as this other David coin. So it, it creates like a very unique aspect of having digital tokens on the blockchain. So this is where cool use cases actually come about. So when you think about things like baseball cards or like collectibles, art, there's only, you know, like, like one unique one. There's only one Mona Lisa, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the rest of them are all copies. The blockchain helps reinforce the uniqueness of what you're holding in like a digital form. So you could have like, um, uh, let's just say like, um, like a Charizard Pokemon card. Let's just say there are only like 50 of them that exist in the world. You can use something like the blockchain to verify that what you have is actually one of the unique 50, one of them. And that's where the value comes from. And I, I, I've thought this uh, non-fungible token thing to be super cool and amazing for a lot of uh, creators or artists or developers because they're able to sell their, their work a second time again uh, digitally, right? So again, mm. pretty much having a timestamp saying it originally came from if I was, uh, let's say, you know, Banksy, let's say if I was Banksy and I created this digital artwork of this you know, famous uh, you know, painting that I did, and I'm selling it, it has a timestamp saying that it originally came from Banksy and now I'm selling it to who the second person is. And then eventually when they sell it or transfer that token to someone else, you can see who owned it, when it got sold, how much it got sold for, for everything. So again, for collectors, I think this is a very, very, very cool and interesting because right now with you know re regular collectibles, you don't have a whole track record history of who owned it. You, you, it's very difficult to find out all of that information. Whereas with all of this digital artwork, um, Every single thing from the time it was created to every single hand it got transferred to the day, the time, how much it was transferred from, everything is all kept on the ledger. So again, this yeah. is the most interesting thing for a collector, collector to be able to verify that this is actually correct and true and not a replica. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, one of the coolest things that I saw recently is that some of these uh, chips, which store the actual private key that verifies that this is actually the unique um, copy of the uh, the artwork is actually embedded underneath the painting itself. So you just take your phone and you scan this uh, this NFT underneath the paint, and it'll show you on the ledger that this is like you know the the legit version of the painting. So you can apply this not just to art, but you can apply this to like say gaming. So if you ever play stuff like World of Warcraft. There are all these collector items, things that you um, that are of actual high value in the real world. And now you can provably and verifiably say that I own the legitimate uh, whatever like weapon or like cool rare armor you have. You know what I mean? Like it's it's just it enables all of this this new world to exist where people can't lie to each other. You can't sell like a fake Mona Lisa. Nope. And that's what it is with the whole, <laughs> with the whole ledger and everything. Again, that Mona Lisa could be digitized and then resold to somebody else who, who owns a digital copy of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So with ether also, uh, one of the things I know you've always mentioned is that it is. So whereas Bitcoin is the gold standard of cryptocurrency, you've always said ether is kind of like the oil that runs the internet, let's say. Yeah, exactly. Or, it, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good comparison because um, so what I, how Ethereum actually works is when you're doing these computations and you're using resources of the blockchain, you actually have to pay for it. Kind of like with Bitcoin, you have to pay a fee to be able to send Bitcoin to someone else. Now with Ether, in order for you to do computations on the network, let's say the computation is send one fill coin to David. In order for Ethereum to process that, you actually need to pay the fee and it's basically paid in what's called ether. 
So Ether is the native token on the Ethereum blockchain. And I like to call it basically blockchain oil because you need this currency to be able to pay for the computations you make on the network. So the value that people see is that if the demand of using Ethereum goes up, theoretically, the value of the token should also go up as well. So a lot of the people like to basically compare it as oil because it's, it's basically energy. You pay to use the blockchain and the blockchain computes and does things for you. And that's why it's considered blockchain oil, essentially. But right now also with, uh, with uh, it's currently kind of slow and expensive to for any Ethereum transaction. Is that true right now? Yeah, so the problem, David, is actually there's too many people that want to use it and there's not enough throughput on the blockchain. So I think uh, with with um, with Bitcoin, you only get about like seven transactions per second. Um, Ethereum maybe only brings that up to about 15 transactions per second. And when you get all these people that are wanting to use it now, um, you got a ton of demand and we can't just, you know, make more things happen faster on the Ethereum blockchain yet. Because blockchains from a more technical level is, is not very easy to scale without some sacrifices. So thinking about it this way, it just means that right now, everybody's trying to compete for space in the Ethereum blockchain. And people are willing to pay like hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars in gas fees just to ensure that they can get like a trade through, for example. And the crisis that Ethereum is running into right now is that there's too much demand and we can only, the blockchain can only process so much in a certain period of time. So by having these spikes in what's called gas price, um, it pretty much prices out a lot of people that do not have a lot of money, which is not what Ethereum was supposed to be doing in the first place. Uh, so now with one of the next questions we have here from Anthony, he wants to know if the, the Ledger Nano hardware wallet is a good way to store your crypto. Yeah. So like, uh, you know me, I'm a pretty big guy when it comes to security. I mean, that's what I used to do in the military. So like security is, is uh, one of the big things always on my mind. And I've been using the Ledger Nano hardware wallet ever since it was like incepted. And I have nothing terrible to say about the product. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of it also comes down to user education about it as well. But um, it's always good to store your assets in a hardware wallet if you have like a life-changing amount. Um, I believe, like, I think the cheapest Ledger Nano wallet is about like 70 bucks or something around that. And if you feel that that $70 is worth it to protect your $1,000 or more investment, then uh, I'd say go for it. Um, yeah, and I've also been using the the uh, Ledger Nano since uh, since the beginning. Also, you introduced it to me. You told me to use this, and since the beginning, I've been using it. Haven't had any issues at all. It's very easy to use. I haven't had any problems, error, malfunctions. I haven't lost anything. Uh, so again, if I had to recommend one, I would say that one, just because it it's worked very well for me. I haven't tried all of them or any other ones to be quite honest. But uh, having used this one for the like, these ones for the past. I'd say three, three years, three plus years now, no problem at all. So definitely would recommend it in my opinion. Mm -hmm. There was, um, a, so there's actually a couple more hardware wallets. Like I do know of uh, like Trezor as an example, um, but I've never personally used it before. So I can't really speak to it. However, um, there are more than uh, more hardware wallets that you can choose from if you just do a little bit of research out there. But one of the big things that um, Ledger was scrutinized about recently was um, there was an unfortunate hacking, um, I would say at like at Shopify. So when you bought a hardware wallet from Ledger, they used the Shopify platform to store some of the information that, um, that buyers had to, to give. So for example, like your shipping address, your phone number, your email, and unfortunately, some of that stuff was leaked from the, uh, the Shopify platform, which um, in turn uh, created obviously a lot of backlash because people's um, physical addresses were, were now leaked out. So you could find this list of people who bought Ledger wallets 
and know that they have crypto and it has their like home address on it. So unfortunately this, this happened. And I would say one of the ways to really protect yourself against something like that from happening is actually to send your, your crypto related devices or anything like that to like a PO box or to an office uh, somewhere where you can get access to it, but it doesn't expose where you live. So as you guys can see, Phil is either very paranoid or very good at the security stuff. It could be a bit of both, to be honest. But honestly, Phil is, uh, this is his type of, uh, his line of work, securities. He makes sure that you don't get your shit stolen. You don't get hacked. And he's always telling me I need to have like a six step login before I can log into anything. So he's teaching me all this stuff also. So uh, anything securities, ask Phil guys. Yeah, seriously. If you have any questions about uh, how to better protect yourself, online doesn't even have to be like crypto. Um, but crypto obviously is, is a big thing as well. So um, I'd be willing to take those questions as well if you have any. All right. And for our next episode, we're going to wrap this up now. We're going to be talking about entrepreneurship, the importance of trying things and failing at them. But when we say that, it means that you must try it in the first place and you have to give it a good effort. So it's not just a matter of going, failing and saying, ah, it didn't work out for me and it's not my type of thing. No, when we say trying, you really, really have to be passionate about something, put all your heart and soul into it and pretty much learn and want to be the best. And then even if you fail from it, again, with every failure, there's a lot you can learn from it. You can learn why you failed, how you failed, what not to do for the next time, how to improve. And again, that's pretty much why failing is so important in that, in, in that aspect. Yeah, we'll be talking more about this in the next episode. And uh, for all the wannabe entrepreneurs that are just waiting to, to figure it out, or even the ex-entrepreneurs that went back into uh, the corporate world um, and just need a little bit of motivation to really get that edge back. I mean, at the end of the day, David and I can both speak to our entrepreneurial experiences and uh, we'll put it all in the next episode for you. Absolutely. Guys, thank you so very much for, uh, for tuning in. Phil, please give us the outro. Yeah, so uh, you can always find us at knowyourpotential.com. That's N-G-O, yourpotential.com. Uh, and all of our, our social media links are there. You can reach us. Um, feel free to ask any questions. And uh, we'll try to throw them in on a, another episode where we answer all your questions. Thank you for tuning in, guys. We'll catch you next time. Great. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a good week.